Well, it's like Christmas in June at the Hoggard House because we're opening up all these boxes full of stuff. And you never know what's in there. So you open up a box and you look at it and you start pulling things out and you're going, that's where that was. Don't need it, but that's where it was. So, and we still got lots of boxes. They brought the boxes with all of our stuff in it. They brought our adjustable bed back. Oh, I've been sleeping much better. Yeah. And um, what else did they bring? Yeah, all the stuff in the kitchen, dining room. Brought back our living room furniture, our bed. Um, and then tons of boxes. And then Monday, a different company's coming out to bring back the electronics that we had in the house. And the curtains, they always had to be specially clean. And I got a couple pairs of pants that are dry clean only. They go with suit jackets that are here. So I haven't been able to wear a couple of suit jackets because the suit pants are somewhere. But I'll get those back Monday, hopefully. So, and it is like Christmas, because you do, you open up boxes and go, ooh, what was in there? But Lisa couldn't find her shoes this morning. She ain't got to the right box yet. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Give me uno momento, if you would. I am running behind this morning. You can turn to Revelation 6 while I'm rambling on. Revelation 6, let's see here, drop and do that, and nope, yep, that one, there we go, and do this here, and there we go. Next week, we will be going to Bible camp for a week. Pray that it's not 100 degrees every day down there. Pray that it's not. Because it seems like, to me, every year I get just a little bit worse in handling temperatures. And uh, like today. Now today, my face is pro is sweating profusely and there's nothing really I can do about it but from here down I am freezing to death so and it's just kind of hard to get along like that Revelation 6 uh, look at verse actually let's see here is that where I wanted to go yeah I think that is Revelation 6, let's read down a little bit to verse 9. And I'm going to mention a couple of things there, and then we're going to kind of move on, all right? Let's see here. Revelation 6 is the opening of the seals, the book that was sealed, that is in God's right hand. Jesus now holds it in his hand. He has been found the only one worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And every time he opens a seal, something happens. And the first four times he does it, we have, uh, we have horses coming out with their riders. And the first horse, you remember, is a white horse, and he's given a crown. The rider is given a crown, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The second seal was opened, and we have a red horse coming out. Power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. Who doesn't see that coming? How many shootings have we had this year? Mass shootings? Yeah. You know, I think, they, I think we need gun control laws. I think they are to take away the guns of everybody who would use them to shoot somebody and let the people who never want to shoot somebody keep theirs. Does that sound about right? That's what I think. But we can, we can see in our society right now 
Hatred building up. Hatred building up. And instead of our nation unifying, we have people that are driving everybody further apart from each other, and they're all hating one another. And that's going to last only so long, and then that red horse comes out. It's going to take peace from this earth. And I may be wrong on that scenario, but that's coming anyway. Verse 5, he had opened the third seal, and there was a black horse, and he had a pair of balances in his hand. And um, we read last week Ezekiel chapter 14, where God talked about his four sore judgments. And he said it was the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the wild beast. And that is almost exactly what you have here in Revelation 6. So I think those two places in the Bible, I think they're paired together. They, they complement one another, okay? Um, would you ever put ketchup on ice cream? No, that's disgusting. Would you put ketchup on a bologna sandwich or a hot dog? Yep. How do you eat yours? With mustard or Miracle Whip. Miracle Whip will work. Huh? <laughs> on your ice cream? So that's what I mean. Catch up on a hot dog. They complement each other, right? They work together. So that's Ezekiel 14 and Revelation 6. And then, uh, number, verse 8. And I looked and behold a pale horse. And his name that sat on, him, sat on him was Death and Hell. Notice the D and the H are capitalized. And it's like... The Bible is personifying these two things. It's like there's a spirit called hell and a spirit called death. I will say that in a lot of places in the Bible, in the New Testament, New Testament was written in Greek. The Greek word that is often used in the New Testament for hell is the word Hades. And in Greek mythology, Hades was both a, a place, it was the underworld, and it was also the name of the god of the underworld. The place was called Hades and the god was called Hades. Now, I'm not using that for my doctrine, but clearly you see here a horse coming out and there is a rider on that horse and his name is Death. And then Hell is following with him. And I don't remember if I, if I touched on this, but in Isaiah 28, I think it's Isaiah 28. Let's look there. Let's open up that box and see what's there. Since we've been opening boxes all week. Opening those boxes is like, who wants to be a millionaire? It's like playing that game. Because you're hoping you're going to open up a box and find a million dollars in it. Uh, what did I say? Isaiah 28. There is a very interesting passage in Isaiah 28. Um, let's see here if I can find it. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Um, verse 15 of the Isaiah 28. God said, because you have said we made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. I want to touch on this just for a minute. In the years that I've been pastoring people, one thing that I have found out to be regrettably true is that people will look me in the eye and lie through their teeth to me. They'll do it. I told you the story of a man and him and his wife. We, we were their pastor when we were at Richwoods. And after we came up here a couple years, um, they came seeking us out. They were having problems in their marriage. And we were... When we left Richwoods, we were pretty good friends with them. 
but the wife thought that her husband was running around on her. And so I got him alone and I just talked to him a little bit. And I said, Kevin, anything you tell me in this office has to remain private unless you give me permission to say something. And I said, are you having an affair with another woman? And he looked me right in the eye and said, no, I'm not. So I said, well, then, you know, there has to be an explanation for your behavior. And he talked about how his dad killed himself out in the front yard and he saw that and he's really depressed. And so that's what I told his wife. I said, the only thing I could get out of him. Well, I found out later that in fact he was having an affair with another woman. Now, I wasn't going to beat him up over it. I wasn't going to shoot him. I wasn't going to get my paddle and paddle and spank his rear end. All I wanted to do was to show him Christ's love that God can heal this thing. God can forgive you if you want forgiveness. God can forgive you of anything you've done. Just confess it. Just be sorry for it. And God will forgive you. But he refused. He refused that. And he lied through his teeth to me. So, people, that's what that verse says in verse 15. We have made lies our refuge. In other words, when we do things that are wrong, we will either say we didn't do it, or we will say things, we'll reinvent the Bible and say, according to how I read the Bible, that's not wrong. That's not a sin. Or they'll say, there are people out there doing worse things than me, so I must be a good person. And none of those work. What they're doing is making lies their refuge. They're hiding. I mean, what did Adam and Eve do? When they got caught in the garden, when they, when they ate the fruit, the first thing they realized was they were naked. And what did they do? Went and covered themselves. They didn't want the shame of their nakedness to appear. And so this is what he's talking about. They made lies their refuge. And I, I'll tell you this, you can only tell so many lies about a story. After a while, it's hard to keep up with the lies that you told. Any good police investigator knows this. That if someone's lying, and you think they're lying, or you want to find out if you're lying, you give them a series of questions, and then a few minutes later, double back on one of those questions and ask it again, see if they answer it the same way. Because a lot of times when they lie, they can't remember what they just said because they were inventing new lies. And that's how the brain works. So they made lies their refuge. Instead of like Psalm 91, where the Bible says, those who love the Lord, we make God our refuge. Yes, I have sinned. Yes, I've done wickedness in the sight of God. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to try to say I didn't do it. Or I'm not going to justify it by saying it wasn't wrong. What I did was wrong. And the best thing I could have ever done is to run to my heavenly father and beg his forgiveness. And he's always given it to me. So they made a covenant with death and hell. If you look in verse, uh, yeah, verse 18, your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. Now, again, I think these passages, this verse matches that fourth horse that comes out where it has death and hell coming after it. Because I see in this world a lot of people make a, a covenant or agreement with death and hell and they usually pronounce it like this me and God have our own thing going well if that's the case then why did Christ have to die there's only one way to be redeemed and that's through Christ Anyway, God said, your covenant with death and, uh, shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. 
So if you're counting on your lies being your refuge, if you're counting on the story that you told or your version of the story to be your refuge, if you're counting on that, it's going to catch up with you. And God says, when the overflowing scourge comes, they're going to trample you to death. I, God, am going to make sure that happens. This is one of the reasons why I try to not gloss over myself and my own weaknesses to anybody in this church. To anybody here, anybody online. Now, I may not spill the beans of every single thing that I do that's wrong. But one of the things that I think is right to do is to be honest with yourself first. Because after a while, you start believing your own lies, don't you? Like the, my first deer I killed gets bigger every year. You start believing your own lies, and to you then that becomes truth. And likewise, this church, if you goofed up, lots of people do it. Lots of church people do it. We wouldn't have to come here if we never goofed up. But just by the fact of you showing up today is a testimony that says, I'm a mess. I've done wrong. And I need God's forgiveness. I need people's forgiveness. I need, my, I need to forgive myself. You're actually refusing to make lies your refuge and you will not make a covenant with death or hell. Your covenant will be with Jesus Christ. Now, uh, verse 9, back at Revelation. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Um, so verse 9, and when he had opened the fifth seal, five, the number five represents death represents death. Uh, and I had to be convinced of this one time by somebody. I, the first book I wrote about Bible numbers, I, I missed it. I missed the real meaning of the number five. And a guy wrote me and he said, would you look at this pastor? I think the number five means death. And I'm going, my ego says, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. I've studied this, so I know. But then I started looking at it. And I'm going, you know what? I think he's right. Moses wrote five books out of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch. Genesis through Deuteronomy. And Paul calls that the law of sin and death. And that if you make the Mount Sinai covenant with God, you are surely going to die because no one ever obeyed all of the commandments of God. Everybody's broken them except Jesus Christ. And there's other things that I could throw in here that I won't. Um, well, let me say this. What, what significant animal was created on the fifth day of creation? Does anybody just take a wild guess? A very significant, there's a story about it in the Bible. God created, he mentioned a specific animal that he created on the fifth day of creation. Whales. Is there a story in the Bible about whales. And when Jonah was swallowed by that whale, he said that he was in the belly of hell. The whale signifies hell. Jesus said, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. So that's where we have a connection here. So on the fifth trumpet or the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now let's deal with this subject for a few minutes. 
the leadership in our country is so far reprobate and so far to the extreme left that it's really building up and leading up to a very dangerous time for us to still have the freedom to say that what sin is is wrong and you should not commit it and I don't care what sin it is whether it's fornication, adultery, or homosexuality, all of those are a sin. But we're getting into a time now when the LGBTQ people are put so far on the forefront, and I'm even talking about children's shows. Nickelodeon, Disney, Whatever happened to Mickey Mouse? Disney shows, Nickelodeon shows, shows made for kids where they are exploiting these children by constantly throwing at them images of transgenderism, sodomite relationships, and so on. Forcing it down our kids' throat. And yet, we're a threat if we try to teach God's love to some child somewhere. They'll turn you in for that. Okay? I mean, this world's getting messed up. It's getting messed up bad. So we have under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So two questions you've got to ask. Number one, will there come a time when I might not believe this Bible anymore? Will there come a time that I might not believe what God said anymore in his Bible? And trust me, that faith will be challenged. It's been challenged with me multiple times. So much so, I've never, never really told what the situation was that brought me to a day of despair. And I don't think I want to tell it today. But Lisa and I found out something and it just crushed me. And I was really struggling. And we were sitting in the front seat of our van. It was going to be just, we were out on an anniversary trip. And I picked up this Bible I kept in the car and I said, Lisa, I'm beginning to think maybe this book's not true. And Lisa said, by the Holy Ghost, she said, Mike, you know that Bible's true. I did. I knew it was true. But God was teaching me how to wait and be patient and trust His way over my way. And I promise you people, God's way is always better than your way. Always. Amen to that. So, there will, I believe, there has been, and there is now, and there will continue to be a time when those who say, I believe the Holy Bible, the Word of God, and I believe it, it is supreme truth over every other truth, there will be a time when you will be killed for that belief, will it be worth it? It will. That was the issue that Jesus was struggling with the night before his crucifixion when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible said that he was in so much anguish that as the sweat 
came off his brow. It was mingled with blood because he was in so much agony. Probably his blood pressure had jumped up high and was busting all these little corpuscles around his sweat glands and literally he was sweating drops of blood because he was in so much agony because he knew what he was going to have to do the next morning. And he was not... It's like the day I came home, Melissa was at the house, mom was helping a family in our church move that day and I came in the house... And I said, I'm not going to play with my friend David ever again. And she said, what happened? I said, well, I was up there with him and he burnt the tree house down. <laughs> which was only half true. So my loving sister called my mommy. And my mommy got me on the phone and she said, son, you better go in your room right now and close the door and you better pray. And you pray all day long. Because when I get home, and I take my time doing it. When I get home around 8 o'clock this evening, I'm going to beat you back. And trust me, that was the worst whipping I ever got. You know why? Because it took me all day to get it. I agonized all day over that whipping. And my mama was not one of these parents that calmed down and forgot about it. Mm-mm. I don't care how long it was. If I did it and she found out about it, I was getting a whipping. And buddy, she did it. Um, this Bible is worth our suffering. It is worth all of our tears. It, if we had to purchase this book... I would be willing to take every penny out of the bank that I have right now to buy one copy of it if that's what it cost. You can understand then what it looks like when we go to Kenya and we bring with us large boxes full of King James Bibles. They're gone in 60 seconds. And the people are reading them. Those people starving to death for the Word of God. So we're going to keep doing it. Amen? But then they said, they cried with a loud voice, How long will you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Uh, they, they died for the... They were slain for the Word of God. Verse 11... Uh, excuse me, they were slain for the word of God, verse 9, and for the testimony which they held. Now, what is a testimony? Gary, what is a testimony? Now, as a witness in a courtroom, are you allowed to give your opinions? No. The other lawyer stand up to objection, calls for a conclusion from the witness. Objection of sustained. They won't let you do that. You can only tell what you know. That's all they want. That's a testimony. And I'll tell you, if you haven't been saved and you're not right with God, you don't have much of a testimony. But if God has saved you, and you know what kind of person you were before you got saved. I ignored that. Saved. And you know what God made you in after you got saved. Now you've got something that you know. And you can tell people, hey, I don't know much about the Bible. I know some verses. What I and I love it so far. I'm not very gifted at knowing the Bible. But let me tell you what Christ has done for me. Tell them the truth. Amen. That's your testimony for Jesus Christ. And there will come a time when the world won't want to hear it anymore. So they will take the lives of those who believe and hold to the word of God. And they will take the lives of those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ in them. Now, 
I'm just going to throw this in here. I'm not going to explain it much, and I'm going to move on. I read this one day. It says they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And if you've ever seen my teaching on DNA, you know that I believe that DNA is a model of the Bible. It matches perfectly. And literally, in every cell in your body, you carry in your body a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. In your DNA. It's in every cell of your body. So I think, according to Daniel 2 and other places, I think that at this time, people on this earth will have already rejected the DNA that they were given at birth in exchange for having their DNA modified. And when that happens, they no longer carry in their genetic structure a testimony of Jesus Christ. It's not in them. And as such, then they will be judged. Verse 11, white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Something that God does not make it easy on us is when we ask God for something and we believe that he's going to do it, he just didn't do it today. And we wanted it today. How many, be honest, how many of you have ever had such a day that you prayed that today Jesus would appear in the air and take us all home, get us out of here? Yeah. Did he come? No, you're still here. Or maybe he did and we're all wrong. Um, but God said, I'm going to have you wait at, to, the, to the disciples at Jerusalem. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told the disciples one word, wait. Wait for the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Just wait for it. What do you want us to do then? Wait for it. Well, after we wait for it, then what do you want us to do? I want you to wait some more. You'll wait until I'm ready to send it. Because I found out that God's timing is always better than my own. And so they're told that they're asking, Lord, how long before you avenge us of our blood that's been spilled? And God says, just rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now, uh, I'll probably get into that maybe next week a little bit about persecution. If, if our nation follows the trends that are taking place in this world, they literally will probably come to a point in which um, Bible Christians will be designated as a terror group and a hate group and it will be illegal then to believe and trust in the Word of God, much less try to share the Word of God with others. What is the first thing that every communist dictator does the moment he takes over a nation? What's the first thing he does? Take up all the Bibles. Get rid of all the Bibles and get rid of everybody's guns. Disarm the whole nation and take away all their Bibles. Okay? So that we can come in and electronically smuggle them back into their nation. But they got to get rid of the Bible. You know why? Because the Bible can, a Bible can take a man in North Korea and make him free even if he still lives in North Korea. That man will be free. And you know what? You can't stop a man like that. You can't stop him. If he's got that joy in his heart, you know what he's going to do? He's going to tell other people in North Korea about Jesus Christ. He's going to read the Bible to them. And I guarantee you, those people over there, they're starving to death. It's like...
my, our friend Tim Barron's going up here to this Muslim mosque while they're having prayer. Takes his shoes off, goes into where these guys are praying to their idol in Mecca. And the guys turn around and look at him and he's handing them out gospel tracts written in Arabic. The name of this tract was Allah had no son. And I told that to a guy we met at one of the prophecy meetings we Kamal something, and he said it's enough to know that with a tract in his hand ready to give to somebody who just might be set free from the devil would it be worth you giving up your life if you knew that in your death somebody that you love will get saved as a result of it would it be worth it it would be so in that sense death to us is really not that big a deal because it won't last for us amen father this book is so good Lord, I get fearful a lot. I get afraid of things. Terror gets a hold of me. Panic. Some days, God, you know me, I'm just shaking. And I can't help it. My flesh is weak. But God, you're strong. And Father, if, if I want people to see anything in me, I would much rather them see you in me than to just see me. Because I'm not who some people think I am. I'm not Mr. Super Christian. I'm not the best man in the world. I'm just an old sinner that was saved by the grace of God and nothing else. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you instill that in our hearts today. Help us to remember, God, that we're on this earth only temporary. And our death is a graduation to life eternal, where we never will die again. Father, bless this word. Maybe, maybe Lord, it, it would be us under the altar crying to you, God, how long before you take vengeance for them spilling our blood? That may be us one of these days. And if that's your will, so be it. Because if our faith, God, is not worth dying for, it's not worth living for either. And I know this faith is absolutely worth living and dying for. Bless the word in these people's hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Yeah.